Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover and thank you for joining me here in the New Order, the last days of Europe, in which we're going to explore the Amur Refugee Zone. With Daddy Tabby's Mad Empire gone, Anatoly Sobchak has returned to Russia to do what he can for his people, begging, borrowing, or stealing whatever resources are in the area. His makeshift government desperately seeks to... Th seeks the aid of any organization that is willing to assist in order to help the refugees who have fled to the Far East. It seems a hopeless task, but Sobchak cannot bear to see his people suffering so. Which, Sobchak is actually a real-life person. I actually looked him up a little bit. I don't know much about him, but he had quite a story here in, at least in Russia. Maybe not the Amur refugees in real life, but we do have a critical supply shortage. Oh, plus 50% supply consumption. Oh my gosh, but never enough. Anatoly Sobchak's pr first proper day in Russia was nothing if not busy. The moment dawn broke, the former mayor of Chita was bound down the banks of the Amur to follow up with his contacts within Manchukuo. They had promised all kinds of supplies and valuable goods to aid his efforts, so it's only natural that when he had met with these so-called friends of his, they claimed that their deliveries were held up by red tape and various other bureaucratic inconveniences. Undeterred, Sobchak wasted no time making a beeline for the coast to discuss terms with a wealthy American who claimed to be interested in lending a hand. The meeting did not go well, though. The American had neglected to mention beforehand that he wanted cold, hard cash in exchange for soap. Cash that Sobchak did not have. I'm probably saying his name wrong too, but whatever. After some vague promises were made, a deflated Sobchak then looped back to the ruins of Zeya to inspect one of the last remaining armaments industry still in operation. In operation, turned out to be a generous way of putting it indeed, as the factory had a shortage of workers, working equipment, and electricity. It seemed his militia would have to go even further without the, even the bare minimum of equipment. A long day had passed, and Sobchak was not sure he had accomplished anything at all. As he crawled into bed that cold and lonely night, dark thoughts began to creep into places once occupied by cautious optimism. He had returned to Russia to save as many lives as he could, but Sobchak was slowly becoming aware that the, he may have underestimated the challenges involved. Did the rest of the world even care what was happening here? Today, he may have just received the answer to that question. We have to keep trying, and he is a despotist. At least, that's what it appears to be. And it's KNSR. Okay. We also have some uh, some dudism, Vladislav Konev, okay, and there's also some national daddyism, Rozevsky, even though I thought he was taken out, but from across the seas, Anatoly, we have not forgotten about your efforts to bring salvation to Russia's people. You helped us in the past, and now the, allow us to help you. Please accept this shipment as a demonstration of our faith in you, sincerely a friend. Sobchak already had a relatively clear picture of who this friend could be. It wasn't too long ago that he was caught up in the whirlwind of the resurgent white movement centered in Cheetah with the illegitimate Romanov prince, Mikhail Andreevich, as its nucleus. Sobchak didn't know what had become of Mikhail after they had fled Russia, but he had assumed that this time the former Tsar had given up on Russia for good. He folded the letter and stashed it in his coat pocket, focusing his attention to the tons of Australian grain being hauled off a ship for transport. If not from uh, the... Uh, Mikhail himself, someone sympathetic to his cause, certainly still had a vested interest in Russia after spending so much time scrapping by in a hostile territory. Sobchak found it reassuring that he still had some friends out there. With the situation deteriorating by the day, he could only hope it would be enough. We'll take all the help that we can get. And I like this military law. Kill them all. I love that a lot. Which hurts your leader experience game, but whatever. No racial integration. Okay. Uh, since we're here, we might as well do this one too anyways. Here, have some support weapons. But without strings, my friends, the cold air stung Sobchak's face as he emerged from the passenger side of the jeep. His journeys across the refugee zone had brought him to the derelict dock facilities by the mouth of Amur, now retrofitted to serve as one of the many pipelines leading out of the blasted hellscape formerly known as Russia. As he approached the scene, he was greeted by a rather familiar elderly officer. Anatoly Alexandrovich, I appreciate you coming here on such short notice. It's no trouble at all, Nikolai. Uh, Sobchak looked over Kosov's shoulder to see a group of foreigners being aggressively questioned by his guards. What am I looking at here exactly? Who are these men? Kosov glanced at the scene behind him before turning back to Sobchak. We caught the, these Japanese fellows trying to sneak in by the boat. They claim to be here on a humanitarian mission, but by men think they might be here for a different reason. Sobchak sighed. <sighs> Tell your men to let them go. Japan has no reason to be invading or spying on us. They've got bigger fish to fry than some naive fools in the middle of Siberia. Are you certain, Anatoly? I spent enough time down south to know that Japan never extends her hand for free. You wish to take that risk? For Christ's sakes, Nikolai, let them go. Have you forgotten why we're still standing waist deep in this crap? I'm not about to turn away help on the off chance there might be some strings attached. Do you even know if they're here on the behalf of Japan at all? Kosov nodded. Without another word, and with a call to his men, the aid workers were allowed to continue their mission. As Sobchak had guessed, it was apparently one of the genuine altruism, rather than the pro quid, uh, quid, quid pro quo they were suspected of. The world has begun to take notice of our plight, my friends. 
Actually, what do we have here? Literacy is going up. Let's see. Research facilities, no. Agriculture, no. Poverty is getting worse. We're focusing quite a bit on industrial equipment and expertise. And armed professionalism, but nothing but nukes. Darn. Striking true. Despite the heavy-duty gas mask that clung to his face, Sergei Fedorovich could not avert his nostrils from the miasm of death that permeated the air. His squad had been sent to pick through an old diamond mine in the middle of God knows where, and so far all they had managed to find was frozen cavities and bombed out uh, wooden structures. It seemed like if there was anything at all that once called this place home, it had either been looted or sent to a shallow grave fighting through a trifecta of freezing temperatures. Horrid smells and poisonous air, Sergei made his way to the center of the dig site where the rest of his comrades had regrouped. Sergei! His superior caught out as he approached. He could barely recognize him all under that NBC gear, and Sergei wondered how it wasn't the same story, vice versa. I think we're just about done here. Go take a look in the tunnels, see if we miss anything. The rest of you, get ready to move out. Sergei wasn't enthused about crawling around in a tight space, especially in conditions such as these. He'd hoped that the tunnel had collapsed so that he wouldn't have to bother, but as he arrived at his, at his destination, Sergei's hopes were dashed. The mines were clear of any blockages, for the most part, but that was only about the only positive thing one could say about the condition. Even with his flashlight in hand, the tunnels were darker than any place Sergei had ever been, and naturally they seemed completely barren of any useful minerals. After what seemed like hours of crawling around in the dark, Sergei sighed as he turned to leave, his weary voice echoing off the rocky walls. As he spun around, though a subtle twinkle in his peripheral vision caught his attention, turning back to investigate, Sergei shined his flashlight in front of him and discovered a peculiar rock shining through the rubble. Everyone get in here, we are in business. Very nice. Oh, no head of government, that sucks. And no ministers, but that's okay. 12 hour workdays, not bad. No pensions, no unemployment assistance, and we got some police. Oh, we have state oppression for minorities, wow. Plus, Ultra. Father, are we ever coming back here? The voice of his 12 year old son brought time to a standstill in the mind of Artyom Valentinov, who had been idly staring out across the Bering Sea, waiting for the boat that would take him and his son out of this place. The question was not entirely unfamiliar to Artyom, for of course, for he had once asked the same thing of his own father nearly 50 years ago. The year was 1921, and the Bolsheviks were in the ascent, Artyom, and were in the ascent. Artyom, a child at the time, was forced to flee his homeland towards safer shores. He spent his days in Russia at the time that had been nothing if not pleasant, safely growing up in the lap of luxury thanks to his peasant family's wealth. Of course, it was this wealth that had painted a giant crosshair over each and every member of the Valentinov clan, necessitating their escape from their only home they ever knew. His father's answer, of course, was yes. After many years spent hiding away in Canada, his promise came true nearly three decades later, when the White Army emerged from hibernation and hop in to carry on the old fight once again. The Valentinovs would be among the first to return to Russia to aid them however they could. When they first arrived, though, they had numbered over a dozen, including Artyom, his wife, and his four sons. Now only two of this illustrious clan remained, slowly whittled away by the hordes of a blow in from the west like a terrible storm. When Artyom had left Russia, he did so with a homesickness in his heart, but he knew that it was an entirely different story with his son. He had survived, but not without bearing witness to some of the very worst that humankind had offered. Father, his, vo his son's voice brought him back to the present. Artyom had decided what his answer would be. No, never again. But I hope you enjoyed this video regarding the Anula refugee zone and a little bit about Anatoly Slobchak. If you'd like to read about him, please go ahead. But like I said, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow in another video. Thanks for watching. Have a great, tremendous rest of your day.